Hello and welcome to What's the Story Ghost. I'm your host Annette. And I'm Stephen. And today we are on episode 40. Way! Today we are going to discuss the Flannan Isles Lighthouse Keepers. Have you ever heard the story? No. We crack on? Crackly crack. Joseph Moore took a deep breath in as the outline of the Flannan Isles came into view through the mist. The vibration of the engine on the lighthouse tender Hesperus started to lessen. Captain Harvey had slowed the ship as they were getting closer to the shoreline. Everyone aboard could tell that Moore was anxious. He had skipped breakfast that morning and instead opted for a few strong cups of coffee to keep him going. Moore desperately yelled out into the mist the name of his fellow lighthouse keepers, as he expected them to greet him on his arrival. But the only reply came from the gulls and pestrels shrieking in the skies above the tiny, lonely island in the Outer Hebrides. It had been six days since he received orders from the Northern Lighthouse Board to return to his post in Illamour. But Moore had been delayed making that journey due to poor weather conditions preventing them from sailing until that very morning. Moore's heart was racing, while his mind did him no favours replaying the stories he had heard of. The locals warned it was a bad idea to build a lighthouse on Flannan Isle. The Isles were said to have a mysterious kind of power. It had the most profound effect on the sheep that were ferried there. Sheep that grazed on flan and grass were said to be blessed with twins or even recover from illness. But even though the isle had a bothy for shelter, none of the shepherds would stay overnight. There was talk of fairies now being the only inhabitants on the flan and isles. The locals' warnings were not taken seriously, and in December 1899, the lighthouse was built and lit for the first time. Four lighthouse keepers were assigned to the lighthouse. Each man would work a staggered rotation of six weeks on and two weeks off. Three men worked the lighthouse while the fort took his two weeks off and they rotated accordingly. The rotation seemed to work fine, albeit hard to be away from family. That is until 10 days before Christmas in 1900. Only one year into operation, the lighthouse's 140,000 candle power light went dark. Around midnight on the 15th of December, the SS Archtor, a cargo ship sailing from Philadelphia, passed close to Illinois. The captain noticed that the lighthouse was dark. He reported this upon docking in Leth near Edinburgh three days later. Although the lighthouse going dark was definitely cause for alarm, there was little that could be done due to extremely harsh weather. By sheer chance, Moore had been off the previous duty road and was able to spend Christmas with his children. His feelings had gone from looking forward to seeing his colleagues and wishing them the usual holiday greetings to an unshakable feeling in the pit of his stomach that something had gone terribly wrong. There was no response from anyone in the lighthouse even after the captain sounded the steamer's horn and sent up a distress flare. Once they were close to port, Captain Harvey asked Moore to go ashore and investigate. Perhaps the crew weren't aware of their arrival, which was understandable considering they were late. Moore stepped on the island and felt a sense of unease wash over him. Something wasn't right. Aside from the howling ocean wind and the crashing of the waves, the island was silent. Once on the landing stage, he climbed up the wooden staircase that zigzagged up the cliff face. He saw the gate to the lighthouse enclosure was closed, as was the door to the tower. He entered the lighthouse and called out desperately to anyone inside. James! Thomas! Donald! James Duckett was married with four children, Thomas Marshall married with two children, and Donald MacArthur not married, but at 28 he was the youngest on the rotation. No one answered, so he called again. But once again, he was greeted with nothing but the waves and the crying of gulls. Dread washed over him, something just didn't feel right. He felt his palms grow sticky and clammy with sweat. 
In fairness, he had just ran up 145 feet of zigzag steps. It's not unusual that he would be fatigued. The job was not easy, and evidently neither was the commute. For those of us who are self-proclaimed introverts, dreaming of living and working in a lighthouse in solitude with the sea, here are some things you might want to consider before applying for the position. Being a lighthouse keeper is a 24-hour job. If you were a lighthouse keeper 100 years ago, the expression holding down the fort is quite literally what the job entailed. According to National Park Services, a keeper's shift began at 4pm and lasted until dawn. But if there was a storm, they had to stay at their station tending to the light until the storm came to pass. They had to continuously tend to the lighthouse in full uniform. We're talking blue pants, vest, suit, jacket and hat. If neglected or donned inappropriately, it was cause for a fine or even termination. The light in the tower needed constant maintenance to ensure that it was in tip-top shape, and it was a guzzler. The light consumed 20 barrels of paraffin a year. So no, it was not a glamorous job. But, working alongside the same characters for six weeks at a time, you tend to build a bond with your work colleagues because the job is dangerous, but you do it together. So for Thomas More, he wasn't just calling out the names of his colleagues, these men were his friends. Moore made his way into the silent lighthouse, heading first to the kitchen, normally the cosy hub of the lighthouse life. But the room had a deathly chill about it. The ashes in the grate were cold. The main clock on the wall had just stopped. The table still had the remnants of supper on plates, cold meat, pickles and potatoes. A kitchen chair lay on its side. Had it been knocked over during a scuffle or had someone bolted from the table in a hurry and knocked it? The only sign of life was the keeper's canary half starving on its perch. Moore also noticed that two of the three oil coats were missing from their pegs at the entrance. These coats were not for the comfort, they were for the hazards of the job. It's fair to say it would be madness to go out without them. So why would one of the men exit the lighthouse and leave his behind? Did all three men leave the lighthouse at the same time? That would have been a huge breach of protocol. Even when the men had to collect a delivery of provisions, only two men could go, leaving one to man the lighthouse at all times. So Moore could not understand where the three men were. Confused and disturbed, Moore returned to Captain Harvey and relayed what he saw. Harvey sent out a search party, but as the day drew to a close, no one could find the missing men or any sign of their whereabouts. So four men, including Moore, stayed on the island to operate the lighthouse while everyone else left. There was an investigation conducted on the rest of the island, and the iron railing at the west landing was found to be twisted completely out of shape. The iron railway that ran alongside the path used to bring provisions up the nearly 150-foot cliff face was also pulled from the concrete. A storm was the cause of the damage, according to investigators. It was believed at the time that a terrible accident had killed the lighthouse keepers. The investigation yielded little comfort to the wives and children of those men, I imagine. Interestingly, the logbook contained some intriguing entries. Thomas Marshall had stated, December 12th, Gale north by northwest, sea lashed to fury, never seen such a storm, waves very high, tearing at lighthouse. Everything ship shape. James Duckett irritable. Later that day, another entry said, Storm still raging. Wind steady. Storm bound. Cannot go out. Ship passing sounding foghorn. Could see lights of cabins. Duckett quiet. Donald MacArthur crying. MacArthur's reaction seemed completely out of character, having been a veteran at keeping and was known for being a rough sea dog. The log entries continued becoming more peculiar with each day. December 13th. Storm continued through night. Wind shifted west by north. Duckett quiet. MacArthur praying. Later on the 13th. Noon. Ray daylight. Me, Duckett and MacArthur prayed. December 14th. 
no log entry was made. The final entry was supposedly chalked on a piece of slate, which would normally have been transferred to the log book at a later time, so not unusual. December 15th, 1pm. Storm ended. See calm. God is over all. The mention of the men praying is puzzling. All three men were experienced lighthouse keepers who knew that they were in a secure structure 150 feet above sea level and would have known they were safe inside. Furthermore, there had been no reports of any storms in the area on the 12th, 13th and 14th of December, but the island may not have been visible from the mainland. It could have been a very localised storm. So the reports on the weather may likely be true, but as with all spooky stories like this one, as time goes on, additions have been made and existing stories are embellished on. For instance, the reports on fellow keepers' mental states would have no home in a report like this. A Northern Lighthouse logbook is an official process-bound document, not a diary for an employee to keep his personal thoughts. It makes no sense that Thomas Marshall would have written such things about James Duckett, seeing as Duckett was Marshall's superior. This would be similar to writing on a staff message board that your manager is feeling a little delicate after the Christmas party. In fact, the overturned chair, the table with untouched supper, and the clock stopping? None of these details were in the original accounts. These entries would make for a great movie scene, if they were true. According to James Love's recent research, Marsha was previously fined five shillings for his equipment being washed away by a huge gale. As a result of trying to avoid another fine, he and Duckett may have tried to secure their equipment during a storm. Despite having to stay behind to man the lighthouse, MacArthur's fate is likely to be the same. MacArthur may have tried to warn or help his colleagues before being swept away. Walter Aldebert, a flanning keeper from 1953 to 1957, provides another theory. He believed that one of the men may have been washed out to sea, captured by a wave like a giant hand that scooped them up effortlessly. His companions may have attempted to rescue him, but they too were washed away by more rogue waves. There's also a proposal based on the psychology of the keepers. MacArthur was reportedly volatile. This may have led to a fight breaking out near the cliff edge by the west landing that killed all three. Alternatively, one may have gone insane, murdered the other two, thrown their bodies off the cliffside, and then given himself to the sea to be judged by Poseidon. However, it is worth noting that their bodies were never recovered. Of course, theories about what happened include stories of aliens and sea monsters, and an intriguing report suggesting that there had been an apparent sighting of a longboat filled with ghosts sailing to the island on the night the light went dark. Perhaps the most outlandish theory, depending on where you're from, is that some other supernatural occurrence happened to the tree keepers. The Flannan Isles, which are part of the Outer Hebrides, are home to legends of water sprites. They're known as the Blue Men of the Minch, or Storm Kelpies. These creatures are believed to live in caves and drown sailors by sinking ships. Legend says that if the lighthouse keepers had an encounter with these sprites, their only chance of survival would be to win a rhyming jewel. And lastly, there's a local legend surrounding Moore's arrival on the island. Allegedly, when he entered the lighthouse building, three giant blackbirds perched atop the lighthouse flew off into the sky. People claim those birds were the three keepers who were transformed into the avian form as a punishment for violating the supernatural power of the island. Rogue waves, longboat of the dead, alien abduction, storm kelpies, one way or another, those three men are gone. And I'm not sure finding out how would help the families who are left behind. It would be nice to say that their names are but whispers on the wind now. But given the lighthouse is so far out in the outer Hebrides, those howling winds are anything but whispers. What do you think of that story? Yeah. That was cool. Yeah? Yeah, that was deadly. I really love that story. Oh, you have a theory? Go on. More? Yes. How long was he on the island for on his own? Well, he would have stayed behind after... So he arrived on the boat, went up to check on the tree lads, came mm. back down and told the tree 
told the other guys the three lads weren't there. Yeah. So how long was he on the island? Who was checking him? Who like, seen what he did? Oh my who god. Who pushed who seen him push the three <laughs> boys off the edge of the cliff? <laughs> I've solved the mystery. Yes, you have solved the mystery. Also yes. drugs. Yes, definitely drugs. Um I mean like sheep eating the grass, having twins. I don't think it was grass. Maybe he caught the, what came up on top of the hill and caught him in a precarious situation with some sheepies. I can't put that on the podcast, Stephen. <laughs> no, he, he might have been painting the fingernails of sheep. Is that what he was doing? Yeah. The precarious situation would have been eating mushrooms. It could have all been eaten. Yeah, he could have had it. Yeah, he could have picked up the mushrooms. Yeah, yeah, drugs. The island is named after an Irish saint, Saint Flannan. He had a small congregation there and then left out of nowhere because of fairies. And the locals knew about the legends and the locals told them not to build it and they built it anyway. It's a lonely owl life being a lighthouse keeper though. It looks amazing. Have you any photos of the or pictures? I of do it? actually have. It's very pretty. Oh, yeah, it's was... really picturesque. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they'd come up to the landing, they'd climb up. How do you describe them? So like a ladder built into the rock face. Yeah. And that's the and lighthouse. where is this? Is this in... Uh... Scottish Outer Hebrides. Yeah. So think of the northernmost point of Scotland. And go north, south, east, west. Okay. And it's out in the middle of nowhere. There are some jagged parts of the cliff that come out in a point, but they nearly go into a cave, if that makes sense. So there's two points. Yeah. Obviously, I'm immediately going to go with aliens because that's just the way my brain goes. Yeah, and I do yeah. believe in fairies. But if I was to go with a really logical way, so the waves would go into the cave and then they would fill up the cave with so much pressure that that water would just burst back out again. Yeah. And those waves were super, super dangerous. So I think what happened was MacArthur was man in the lighthouse and he saw that the two guys were going down to fix gear that was loose and they didn't want to get fined for losing their gear again. And he saw a rogue wave coming because you can obviously see the, yeah. you know, from swimming and stuff, you, you can kind of see where there's rip tides and stuff like that. Yeah. He saw the wave coming in, it came in and it took all three of them. That's that's the most logical thing I can come up with. I don't think that's actually one of the guys, no, but that, that's essentially the light that they had. So they had to keep making sure that it was clean and that the glass was clear and that there was no obstructions or anything like that. That's... A bothy. So for any of our non-Scottish listeners, a bothy is a Scott term for an abandoned cottage, croft or homestead, a form of shelter. It's used by adventurers and outdoor enthusiasts as like a form of free accommodation uh, when out exploring Scotland's untamed wilderness, which is vast. Like the whole of Scotland yeah. is just beautiful. Um, but the, it says here the shacks lack any creature comforts like running water or electricity. But they use character. And you can only imagine how many people have actually stayed yeah. in it before you. Like there was a bothy on the island, but even the shepherds that brought their sheep mm. there were like, mm, no, I'd rather ferry my sheep back it all in one day mm, yeah. um, instead of staying here because there were there were just far too many stories about stuff. It's very hard not to get swept up in the whole magic of it all. So have you any characters for me? I do. I have a couple. Okay. All right. So let's start with Ducket. Okay. Uh, I have a, a Jared Butler to throw in there. Would you like a bit of Jared Butler? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then Thomas Marshall. Yes. Just to throw in a wild card. Go on. Like to throw in a com- comedic actor. Uh, Neil Patrick Harris. Okay, yes, because you have to have the funny guy if you're going to be stuck in the in a room. Like yeah. yeah, I yeah. get that. Okay. Okay, and then the guy who... Wait, Neil Patrick Harris is from How I Met Your yes. Mother, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> He's that guy. And then the last fella is... Donald MacArthur. Donald MacArthur. He was the baby. He was the baby. He was the youngest of them. He was twenty. He was also volatile as well. Yes. I would like to propose Aaron Paul. You may not know him, but he is Jesse Pinkman in Breaking Bad. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has his moments. Yeah. Do you know what I feel like? Just picture him being like really bratty. If you put Jesse in there, just picture him being like, "No, I know what I'm doing. Don't show me. I know how I've learned." Yes, yeah, exactly that and more. Now this one that I was, he came straight to mind as we were talking about more because basically more is the main character yes. in this film, and he does not have a lot of speaking lines other than shouting out the guys' names. Yeah, and he walks up the steps and he finds somebody and he walks down. Well, in the meantime, he pushes them off the cliff. But that's <laughs> that's the difference here. But this this particular character is, and I've been watching Better Call Saul a lot recently. But Jonathan Banks plays Mike Ehrmantraut, and you know, there's also Mike Ehrmantraut in Breaking Bad as well. It just does, he's so much facial expressions. You can see every, everything in his eyes, but you can yeah. see 
that he wants to be good and he's trying to be good, but he knows he has to do his job, the, the, the job, yeah. which is not good. No, but he's good at not being good. Yeah, but he's very good at yeah. not being good. And that's all I. That's all I have. That's more characters than normal. Kathy Bates is. Fucking Cathy now. She's James Duckett's the... wife. Yeah, cool. There you go. She looks like she has four kids. She's running the house while he's gone. And... I don't know how many kids Cathy We should get to know things about Cathy Bates. We should Bates. really get to know Cathy Bates. Cathy Bates, if you're listening, give us a quick call. Would you like to know the rabbit hole I fell down? Yeah, go on. It's actually very relevant to the episode because I got really intrigued because obviously as well, Hold on, hold on. You're giving me a rabbit hole. It's relevant. You don't keep to... You go off the tangents. This is weird. No, no, no. This is relevant, I promise. I That's promise. what I mean. Oh, okay. Because as a self-proclaimed introvert, I was like, oh, I'd love to. And then I was like, no, no, no. I'm terrified of open water. Despite having done my face, my fear, swim in Killary, uh, it's not for me. No, thank you. Um, but the idea of working in a, a beautiful building is just lovely. So I did a bit of research on lighthouses, and I found that the first known lighthouse belong to the pharaohs of Alexandria in Egypt. That lighthouse was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Oh, nice. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, the oldest existing lighthouse in the world is uh, in Spain. It's called La Corona. Cru- oh, yeah. Please forgive me if I've said that wrong. That was constructed in 20 BC. So that's like super, super, super old. Uh, the first lighthouse in America was in Boston on Little Brewster Island. It was built in 1716. The oldest existing lighthouse in America, as in it's never been rebuilt, it is still standing, is in Sandy Hook in NJ, is that? New Jersey. New Jersey. Uh, That was built in 1764. The newest shoreside lighthouse, and definitely by far the coolest, and if you want to work in one, this is the one you want to work in, is in Sullivan's Island in Charleston. It's a triangle-shaped lighthouse, which I think is amazing, and it is the only lighthouse equipped with an elevator. Cool. Uh, the tallest lighthouse tower is in Cape Hatters. That's 196 feet. I didn't convert it into meters. Can you do that real quick off the top of your head? No, uh, no that's okay. That was built in 1872. The first American built West Coast lighthouse was Alcatraz. The rock. I know. I thought that was really cool. Lighthouse keeping was one of the first US government jobs available to women in the 19th century. Cool. I thought that was pretty cool. But that was the rabbit hole I fell down. Uh, That's the rabbit hole. It was very relevant, but I actually just, I just, I was fascinated because I think the people that work in these kind of jobs are super, super brave. Those and like crab fishing and, you know, oil rigs. I just think you're all mad. <laughs> Anything to do with the ocean. I'm like, okay, no, thank you. You should not go to Australia. It is the land of no. I don't know how people survive. Like, he, not even like, oh, it's the outback and oh, like all the animals and stuff. Like some of the temperatures get up to like 115 which I think is like over 40. I, I can't know. Are we finish it there? I think we're good, yeah. So thank you so much for listening to today's episode. If you have any questions or queries regarding today's or any other episode, please feel free to DM us on our Instagram. It's What's the Story Ghost. And if you have any personal stories you would like to share or recommendations, you can email us on at what's the story ghost at gmail.com. And those are all my words. Say your words. I did say my words. I forgot to say that. You do, <laughs> you do your thing. Exit jingle. Exit jingle. If anybody happens to know this little jingle, feel free to DM us. Oh, yeah, I know what it is. Bye. Bye.